If you need a Bible this morning, raise your hand. We're in Matthew chapter 18 today. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible. Matthew 18. All right. Verse 1 says, At that time, Jesus, excuse me, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Father, thank you again. Just bless God to be able to pray. And God, we know we can never pray enough. And so before we dig into the study of your word. We pray that you would lead us, guide us, teach us through your Holy Spirit, whose purpose is to bring glory to the Father and the Son. And we pray that that would happen. God, we pray for every mom in this room this morning that you would bless, encourage, and strengthen. God, that you would fill each cup to overflowing. God, that you would turn any mourning into dancing, any sorrow into joy. Father, we're so thankful for the gift of our moms. And Lord God, we know that you have just been exceedingly good to give us such wonderful, precious gifts. We pray that you'd speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're a mom in this room, um, would you stand up this morning? We just want to acknowledge you and thank you for being so awesome. Give it up for the moms now. Come on. Thank you. Just want to say good morning to my mom. I love you, mom. You uh, are a total gift, and sorry for all the havoc I caused in your life. It's really bad. I say this every year on Mom's Day. You know, I I say to my mom, you know, I I can't help it. Stuff pops into my brain, and I think, wow, out of five kids, I was the last one. She had to to end with the hardest. And uh, so from time to time, I'm like, Mom, sorry I gave you such a hard time. Honey, you were an angel. You, were, you never did anything wrong. I'm like, Mom, who was on drugs, me or you? <laughs> so grateful for my mom and grateful for my wife, who is an amazing mom. Uh, Mom's Rock. Mom's Rock. That's the title of this morning's message, Mom's Rock. And moms should be honored. I think that it would be okay if every day was Mother's Day. Um, For us to affirm and honor and respect all that moms do. And you know, you can't overstate it. Uh, Moms pour their hearts out, as we're going to see in just a little bit. And you know this, moms, oftentimes in ways that aren't glamorous, many times behind the scenes. But I'm glad that we have at least one day. Maybe maybe every day would um, make Mother's Day not so special, but I'm glad that we have one day every year where we can affirm and acknowledge the investment, uh, the heart outpouring that our moms give. I, I don't know if you know the history of Mother's Day, but back in 1907, May of 1907, there was a lady, her name was Anna Jarvis. Uh, she was from Philadelphia, and she had this idea. She wanted to have a day of reflection and quiet prayer among families for moms, uh, for all that moms do. And so she had this idea. She created an initiative within her church, and they had a day that was set aside specifically for that. You know, over the course of history, everybody's wanted to take credit for Mother's Day, um, but really this is the history of it. She said these words, and I, I like them. I think they're meaningful. She said, Mother's Day is in honor of the best mother who ever lived, the mother of your heart. And I think that we feel that way. When we think about our mom, uh, we can say for probably the most part, uh, our mom was the greatest mom. One mom described motherhood like this. Uh, She said, it can be the best of times and it can be 
the worst of times. It can be a mixed bag. And you know, a lot of times, moms, um, you know, they feel overwhelmed. It's hard work being a mom. You know, you wonder if you're doing a good job. You pour into the lives of your kids, and there's always this worry, this kind of nagging thought in the back of your mind, uh, whether you're doing a good enough job. You compare yourselves to other moms. Sometimes you feel undervalued, right? Sometimes you feel underestimated. Uh, sometimes you feel under-esteemed. Like I said, it's uh, a lot of behind-the-scenes work, not all of it's glamorous, changing diapers, doing laundry, making meals, that rarely you get a thanks for, but you know, you do it to the glory of God. It is hard work being a mom, and I think what amplifies the difficulty sometimes in our culture is we have a culture that doesn't really value children. Um, and so, so when you take all of that and you put it together, really moms are up against a lot uh, with the current of our culture. And today, I just want to encourage you moms. I think that, and this is the point of this morning's message, I think the value of motherhood can be discovered in the value of what's been entrusted to them. I think the value of motherhood, and you know as well as I do that, um, like I said, this culture doesn't really um, esteem children. And because it doesn't esteem children, it doesn't really esteem motherhood. You can uh, be talking to people, moms, out in the, out in a, uh, you know, wherever you're out, out in life, you get the question, hey, what do you do for work? Your response is, well, I'm a mom. And the response sometimes is this, oh, you don't work? And you know, motherhood is a lot of work. I think uh, uh, a couple years ago, Forbes did a study, and they took all the different tasks or jobs that moms fulfill, counselor, uh, laundromat, uh, cook, you know, I mean, it's a long list, right? They took every one of those jobs, they took the average wage of every one of those jobs, they put it all together, and they estimated that if you were really going to pay a mom for all of the things that she does for her kids, her average yearly wage would be about $175,000. Yeah, cha-ching, you know. Start collecting that paycheck now. But sometimes you do feel, you do feel like what you do doesn't have value. You look over the course of time and you wonder whether you've, you've done a good job. Um, sometimes there's this nagging thought if there's any purpose in what you're doing. And uh, I just want to remind you moms today, Psalm 127.3 says this, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, <clears throat> excuse me, the fruit of the womb, not the fruit of the loom. <laughs> the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. The Word of God says that children are a reward. I'm like waiting for an amen. Uh, you're like, well, you know, not my kids. Not my kids. You know, our culture says um, kids are a detriment. Our culture says when you have kids, you lose. Our culture says that kids infringe on your freedoms, but that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that children are a reward. I want you to turn to your neighbor today and say this to them. Children are a reward. Okay, for those of you who are parents, I want you to say to them now, my children are my reward. <laughs> are you lying this morning in church? You're like, <laughs> Crazy scene here in these verses. Breathtaking moment as we just read. The disciples come to Jesus and this is their question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They've been vying for position. They've been fighting for preeminence. All the way up to um, just before the crucifixion of Jesus. James and John's mother brings her boys to Jesus and says, Hey, how about these boys, my boys, sit one on your right, one on your left. That's a good mom, right? Wanting the best for her kids. But the disciples had this idea. Um, and this idea, of course, was generated by the root of pride. Who is going to be the greatest? And probably, look, this, this is speculation, um, but 
probably they were waiting with bated breath as to whom Jesus would say was the greatest among them. Was it Thomas? Was it Peter? Was it James? Was it John? There were 12, there were three um, within the 12. And in this moment, uh, Christ could have, breathtaking moment, drum roll please, Christ could have selected who was the greatest among them, but he does something totally unexpected like Jesus always does, right? He does it in their lives, and he does the unexpected all the time in our lives. He does something that uh, was uh, almost inconceivable for the disciples. He takes a little child, and he pulls this little child. This is not a teenage child. (laughs) We're going to see that very clearly by what he says about this little child. Probably 10 years old or younger, takes this little child, pulls this little child into the midst of the disciples, and then begins to teach them lessons about being a child of God through what the disciples knew about being a physical child. Now, this is the, this is the approach to these verses this morning. And this was what Jesus was saying to his disciples. What's true about this little child should be true about the new believer, about the new disciple. What's true about the little child is true about the disciple of Christ, particularly those who are young in their faith. You know, as you read these verses, this really, for the most part, is always the thrust of the commentator or the teacher. We learn things about what it means to be a disciple. Um, We learn things about how we are to handle young believers through this illustration of a little child. We're going to handle this backwards. We're going to go the other route this morning. And I just want to learn some things about how God views children. And the reason I want to do this is because as we see how God values children, this is what it does. It builds your understanding of the value of motherhood. You know, motherhood is a sacred trust. From the time of conception, from the time of conception, motherhood is a sacred trust. God has entrusted moms with what is most valuable. And I want to encourage you as you think this through, moms, you have to walk away this morning understanding that you have great value in the eyes of God. That God has entrusted you with something so precious as little children. And then in addition to that, as we see the value of motherhood, this is what the rest of us should do. The rest of us should support. The rest of us should surround moms um, and empower them to fulfill the calling of God upon their lives. So just a couple of things this morning about the beautiful gift of kids. The Bible says in verse 3, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted... And become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as his little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So he does the, he does the counterintuitive. He pulls a little child into the midst. They're thinking of who is the greatest. And of course, if Christ is going to talk about who is the greatest, he's going to pick somebody um, of lofty stature. He's going to pick the, the, the spiritual giant. He's going to pick the one who's got the most experience and the religious background. And he does the exact opposite. He takes a little child. Listen, in this particular culture, though they valued children, they did not value the opinion of children. They didn't value the, 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 the mindset of a child. Uh, and so what Christ does is he pulls his little child into the midst and he teaches his disciples that children, this is, this is number one, children are souls eager to believe in God. Children are souls uh, who are eager to believe in God, and this is because of their humility. He identifies this quality, this characteristic um, of kids. It's so natural for them to have an eagerness to believe in God. You know, if you have kids, you know this is true. As you're raising your kids in those very early years, um, it is natural for them to believe in God. As you talk about God, um, as you talk about the love of God through Christ the Son, you're not getting a lot of arguments. You're not getting a lot of philosophical debate. Um, You're not getting a lot of of pushback. I know this was the case for our kids. As we talked about God, it it was just natural 
It's natural for them to, to believe in God. In fact, it was kind of like, duh, yeah, of course he exists. There's an eagerness within the heart of little children to believe in the existence of God. It is natural, number one. Number two, they trust their mom and dad. They trust their mom and dad. So you have this heart that is just predisposed to believe. Um, and then in addition to that, you have this relationship with your child, this trust relationship uh, in the very early years, changes as they get a little older. But in the early years, they are willing and ready to believe every single thing that you say. These hearts are, they're ripe. They're ripe to believe in God. Uh, Psalm 14.1 says this, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And so the older you get without God, the more foolish you become. The more arguments you have. Uh, the more predisposed you are not to believe in the existence of God. But in those early years, moms, this is what you have. You have a heart that God has entrusted to you to steward, to nurture, to take these moments. You know, some of you might think this is ridiculous, but when, when Rachel was pregnant with our babies, I would read the scripture while our little child was still in the womb. We believe that God's word had that much power. And then as... As there was birth in those early years, we would sing songs, worship songs that were the word of God over our kids, believing that the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And we would be in the scriptures with our kids. We'd be praying. Alec, when he was four years old, just so predisposed to put his trust and faith in Jesus Christ. This is what God, this is what God has entrusted into the hands of of moms, more important than financial portfolios, more important than real estate holdings, more important than precious jewels and cars and things like that, that so often are esteemed in our culture, what God has placed in the hands of moms um, are the very souls of our children. And those early years are the years, moms, for you to lay the foundation. Now listen, every child is on a journey. Every one of our children uh, will be on a journey to discover their own faith. You lay the foundation, they go through a process of discovering God for themselves because ultimately their faith can't be their parents' faith. And every one of those journeys is unique and different. God is faithful all along the way. But as you lay the foundation, let me tell you something. You can stand on this promise. God will be faithful to you. Abraham Lincoln you guys know him? He's one of my favorite presidents, maybe, maybe number one. He said this, all that I am or will be, I owe to my angel mother. And his mom was a godly mom. She read to him uh, the Matthew Hem Henry commentaries almost cover to cover. Uh, another one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan, said this, from my mother I learned the value of prayer, how to have dreams and learn that they could come true. And of course, most importantly, God, he said this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So in other words, listen, God is going to be faithful. Moms, God is going to be faithful. He's entrusted you with a soul that's eager to believe. John Newton, uh, the uh, great hymnist, who wrote Amazing Grace, you remember he was a slaver. He was a, a captain of a ship that was transporting slaves from Africa um, to the new land. And he had a conversion experience. But his conversion experience was based upon the faithfulness of his mom, who would sing hymns written by Isaac Watts to her baby boy. And all of that laid the foundation, ultimately, I believe, for that great hymn that he wrote, Amazing Grace. So number one, moms, you have great value. God has entrusted to you souls eager to believe in him. The second thing is this. Um, God has entrusted to you souls that are in need of guidance and protection. Verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet 
to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. What an awesome Mother's Day scripture that is, moms. Just drink that one in this morning. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Hey, the second thing that we learn about the value of motherhood is that God has entrusted to you moms souls in need of guidance and protection. Um, Jesus says this, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. The word sin uh, is the Greek word skandaleon, where we get our English word to scandalize. It means to put a stumbling block between little children and God. It means to give them a reason to disbelieve. It means to discourage them in their own individual walk of faith. It means to do things that disconnect them from God instead of connecting them to God. And this is how uh, Jesus warns those who would do such a thing. Be better if there was a millstone hung around your neck. Woe to that person. Take extreme measures not to do that. Moms, what's been entrusted to you are souls that need guidance and protection. Not just words spoken. And the words that you speak are important, but they're not the only important thing that you do. The words that you speak to your kids, the words that you speak over their lives, the guidance and the direction that you give them from the Word of God needs also to be backed up, substantiated by a life that exemplifies those things that you speak. There needs to be uh, an example, a willingness to not just be a speaker of the Word of God, but to be a doer as well. You know, the worst thing that can happen for us in Christian homes is for us to say what our kids ought to do and then to not live it ourselves. The worst thing that can happen in a Christian home is for us to set standards for our kids. Listen, the worst thing that can happen in a Christian home is for us to set standards for our kids that are higher standards than we even have for ourselves. You know what happens when that happens? We give reasons for our kids not to believe in God. We become the justification. Wouldn't that be the worst thing? Wouldn't that be the worst thing to hear from the mouth of the child that's been entrusted to you? Listen, this is for moms and dads. The worst thing to hear would be for your child to come to you and say, hey, the reason I don't believe is because you always said it with your mouth, but you never lived it with your life. God help us. God help us to live out the instructions. God help us to have at the center of our lives the authority of the Word of God. God help us to be humble enough that this book would be first for us and then for our kids. You ever been held to account by your kids before? How's that go for you? I have. Hey, Dad, didn't you say... Hey, Dad, wait a minute. You know, you always tell us, shut up, you little brat. (laughs) Kids are to be seen and not heard. That's how I was raised. I'll let you know when you can speak. I don't know. I hope it doesn't go like that for you. Um, and it doesn't go like that for me. It's like, yeah, well, you know what? There's a standard that, that that is expressed, and that standard is first for Dad, and then that standard is for Mom, And then those standards are for the kids. And you know, the greatest example you can show your kids is the example of humility. A life that's willing to say, hey, you know what, honey? You're right. You're right. I was wrong. (laughs) I was... It's hard to even get out. To humble yourself before your child and to acknowledge that in a particular circumstance. But you know what that does? It validates your whole message. That your life is as submitted to the Word of God as you want their lives to be. And this encourages them. Hey, you know what? This is the pathway. They see it. This is the pathway. When something is done that's wrong, there's confession, even before others, there is a forsaking of sin, and there's a turning of the heart to God for your kids to see that. Your kids need to see it, and my kids need to see it as well. I think dads are the first line of defense 
I think dads, you know, and, and for those of you who are single parents, um, listen, you moms, you have got your work cut out for you. And we as a church are here to support you. Um, for those of you uh, who have kids and, you know, you've got a, a marriage, dads are first line of defense. Dads, you need to be the spiritual priests of your home. Moms, in a sense, are the last line of defense. So listen, if dad is not defending and mom is not defending, in a way, as it goes with mom then, so it goes with the kids. Moms, God has given you a soul, entrusted into your hands a soul that needs guidance and protection. You know, a couple years ago, there was this big thing about tiger moms. Did you guys hear about that? And a tiger mom was a mom who uh, was raising her children in a traditional Chinese way, including strict rules, tough love, and discipline to get her kids to succeed. Um, I think that, I think we should start a group. This, I don't know what you think about this, but I'm trying this out on you. Okay, here we go. I think we should start a group called Moms on Mission. The acronym is MOM. Huh? Isn't that cool? I was thinking maybe Jesus mom or 22-6 moms, Proverbs 22-6. But maybe we do something like this, moms on mission, because moms, that's, that's what you are on. You are on mission, and this is the simplicity of your mission. This is what God wants from you. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him. God's not saying, hey, if you're going to be a good mom, you need to make all your bread from scratch. You need to make sure that you are shopping at Whole Foods. Um, you need to be dedicated to, to homeschooling. I'm not downing homeschooling. We do it. But sometimes there's this idea. There's this mom out there, and she's killer mom. She's super mom. She's got an M on her shirt, and she's the mom that no one can ever live up to, but everybody evaluates their self against, and then you start feeling bad because you're not doing all those things. Let me just simplify it for you moms. First of all, chill out, okay? Chill out. God wants you to love him. God wants you to fall in love with him. Priority number one for you is to be a mom who is in love with God. Take the time to do that. Husbands and kids, give your wife, mom, space to be able to retreat into that prayer closet and to be refreshed in the presence of God to fall in love with him in a deeper way. So mom's number one. Your mom's on a mission. Number one, you need to love God. Number two, you need to give God's love to your kids. You need to be taking it in. You need to be taking it in so you can pour it out. Look, if you are constantly loving but you are not going to the infinite eternal source of love, you are gonna burn out. You're gonna end up flat on your face. You are gonna be broken. You are gonna be discouraged. You're, you're going to look at your life as if it has no value or purpose because you're not connecting to the infinite eternal source of all that you need, whether it's grace or mercy or forgiveness or patience. <laughs> patience. Because you need patience when you're raising kids. Say it today, just like that. Patience. God, give me patience. You've got to be connected to the eternal source. But as you are, this is what God does. He pours him through you to them. That's the will of God for you, for your kids. Your mom's on a mission, giving the love of God to your children. And then the third thing is this. You are making them disciples who are in love with Jesus Christ. You are making them. You're laying the foundation. You're instructing them. You're exemplifying to them. This is priority number one. Before their education, before they're the smartest kids, on the block, before they're the best athletes, before your life gets all tied up in club football or club baseball or club volleyball and everything revolves around it. You know what I'm talking about. Before you fashion them into a little glamour queen or glamour king or however it goes for you. Number one is this, this is your mission. You're on a mission from God to make little disciples of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, verse 18, you know, we talk about missions all the time, but your mission first is in your home. Before it's in Mazatlan, before it's in the Philippines, before it's in this city, before it's in your neighborhood, look, this is the truth. If we do all those things and fail at home, we have failed. And so we want to be faithful first to be uh, men and women on mission. 
making disciples of our kids, you know, and, and um, I think it's important for this generation. I do. I think a lot of people have written this generation off. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, uh, I think a lot of parents, I think baby boomers, if you're a baby boomer, raise your hand. Okay. Yeah. I think baby boomers, can I offend you today? Just, I think baby boomers complain about the generation that they were responsible for raising. Did I just say that? Not all, not all of them. Certainly not you guys. But I think baby boomers were so self-centered and self-oriented that they focused on themselves before focusing on their kids. And this generation is the fruit of that. It's just the fruit of it. The generation before them was a generation that sacrificed. They sacrificed themselves for their kids. That's my parents' generation. I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for their example. I mean, they would give anything. They would do anything. They would lay down anything if it meant a benefit to us. But we have had a generation that hasn't lived like that, and now we see the fruit of it, and the very generation that's responsible is the very generation that's complaining about it. So let me just rework the framework here. This generation, this young generation that we see, that so often we complain about, that we're so afraid of, is ripe for a work of God. Is ripe for a work of God because they are so disillusioned, because they are so broken, because they are so wayward, because they are so distracted, because they have such great tendencies towards violence and lust, because they're exposed to so much. Don't even sit here and say to me, well, you know what, it's pretty much the same today as it was when I was growing up. Are you high still? <laughs> Excuse me, no it's not, no it's not. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is the advent of technology. Kids are exposed to way more than you and I ever were by the stupid phones that they're so connected to. You know, there's a thing called um, urbanization, and what they've discovered is that kids, youth, in very remote parts um, of the world, non-urbanized areas, um, they are being urbanized. There's an urbanization of those youth through technology, through their cell phones. So kids are exposed to so much, and even if they're not in the culture, even if they're not in an urban area, they're being urbanized through technology. Kids are exposed to so much, so much more important for us to see that this generation, because the deal is this, they are wayward, they are in need, they are broken, and because of all of that, they are ripe for God to do a great work. Because when he does it, and I believe he's gonna do it, he is the one who's gonna get the glory for it. So moms, I wanna encourage you. Moms, I want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you. Guide, guide and protect your kids. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad for going to the Bible and lovingly expressing what God's position are th on things are. Susanna Wesley, you know, she is the mom of John Wesley, who was a great revivalist, and she was teaching her young boy about how to discern and sort out whether something was good for him spiritually or not. This is what she said, if you would judge of the lawfulness or the unlawfulness of pleasure. So if you're to take any pleasure and you're to determine which category it fits in, lawful or unlawful, then take this simple rule. Whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, and takes off the relish of spiritual things, that to you is sin. That to you is sin. I might put it in different words. I'd probably say something like this. Don't do anything stupid, you idiot. That's... <laughs> I mean, this is kind of complicated. We don't really talk like this anymore. But she lays out this, this beautiful instruction for her son, and she basically just says this. If, if the things that you're doing, whether it's identified black and white in the Bible or not, if the things that you're doing weaken your reason, cause you to um, not be able to see clearly from God's perspective, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, you know, it causes that, that pricking of the Spirit of God in your heart to become duller and duller. Obscures your sense of God. So as you do this thing, whatever this thing is, you have a harder and harder time hearing and seeing the Lord. Takes off your relish of spiritual things. The more you do it, um, the less hungry you are for the things of God. She says that to you is sin. 
Moms, the kids entrusted to you are souls in need of guidance and protection. The third and final thing is this. Um, they are souls, the value of motherhood, they are souls that have been rescued by God. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man is a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The third and final thing, moms, today is this. Um, there's great value in motherhood. The souls that have been entrusted to you have been rescued by God. The souls that have been entrusted to you have been rescued by God. This is what he has done. Just follow, follow me on this last point. This is what he has done, and this is what he will do. This is what he has done, and this is what he will do. You know, your kids have great value. And their value isn't found in their performance. It's not found in their achievements. It's not found in their awards or their trophies. Um, it's not found in their looks or their intelligence. You know, we don't find value in our kids by living vicariously through them. The value of our kids is based on two things. Number one, they've been made in the image of God. This is big. Number one, they've been made in the image of God. God has entrusted to you kids who are made in his image. That's a big deal. Your kids have value. They're made in the image of God. Number two, your kids have value because Jesus Christ died for them. Christ died for your sons and daughters. He died for my sons and my daughter. He cares so much for your children that he left heaven for earth. He went after your kids. He went after your kids. If your kids were the only people that were living on the face of planet earth, Christ would have still come and gave himself as a sacrifice for their kids, for your kids. That's how much God loves your children. In fact, you could take John 3, 16, and you could kind of rework it like this. Probably a good exercise. For God so loved, now just fill in the name of your kids. For God so loved Alec. You know, maybe for you, your kids have been less than a blessing. Maybe for you, your kids have been an annoyance. Maybe for you, you've been thinking kind of like this, hey, you know what, uh, I would have done all these things in my life, I could have all done all these things in my life if it wasn't for my kids. Uh, and you've, you've just, over the course of time, you've be be begun to lose the value of your children. I just want you to go through this exercise, for God so loved, and just fill in the name of your kid there, for God so loved Alec, for God so loved Hannah, for God so loved Levi, that's how valuable, that's how important your kids and my kids are in the eyes of God. And this is what he'll do. He rescued them. He paid the price for their eternal salvation, for the forgiveness of their sins. And you know what he'll do? He will relentlessly pursue them. God wants your kids in heaven. God wants your kids in heaven. God wants your kids in heaven more than you want your kids in heaven. And I know you want your kids in heaven really bad, but guess what? You wouldn't have ever wanted your kids in heaven unless God had put the desire in your heart. You can't even want them to go to heaven without the want coming from God. He's the one who caused you to want it. And if he is the one who caused you to want it, listen, his want is greater than your want, and his want is the want that's gonna make it happen. God relentlessly pursues your kids. You got wayward kids, you got prodigal kids, you got kids that have gone astray, you've laid the foundation, and now they're not walking with God, and you're thinking, man, what did I do wrong? Well, look, the list is probably long. The list is probably long. My list is long. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God that that what happens with our kids is not absolutely predicated on our perfection as parents. Because guess what? None of our kids would go to heaven if that was the case. We need God's mercy. And when you and I humbly come to him and acknowledge and confess, God, I've not been perfect. Thank you that you are. God, I've not prayed like I should, but thank you, God, that you desire 
God, I don't understand everything that's happening or where they're going, but God, I know that you know, so I'm going to lift this prayer up to you because your word says that my prayers rise like incense to heaven. It's a sweet aroma. It clings to the heart of God. God, I'm going to give it to you. I don't know when. I don't know how, but I do know you will be faithful. I don't know when. I don't know how, but I know you will be faithful. God, you will relentlessly you will relentlessly pursue my kids, even when they're not in my presence. You have the power, you have the ability to bring people into their lives. God, to stir their hearts to pick up the Bible that they've been forsaking for years and decades, maybe. You have the power and the ability, and God, I'm just trusting you, and I'm gonna continue to pray relentlessly until I see my prodigal come home. You know, God is faithful. God loves your kids that much. God is rescued. God has sent his son, he's done all the work, and now God will relentlessly pursue your kids as you seek his face in prayer. You know, we've had so many great testimonies come back from these little prayer cards that you guys put in, and I put in today, into the offering bag, um, and a number of praise reports have come back about how God has returned prodigal kids. You know, I had an awesome conversation with a sister in Christ, she's been going to church here for years, she said, you know what, Pastor, my son has been prodigal. He has a calling on his life. And we laid the foundation, and he has just been gone. He has been gone. He is out into just crazy madness. I put in a prayer request, dropped it in the offering bag, and two weeks later, our prodigal came home. Our prodigal came home. He recommitted his life to Jesus Christ, and now he's walking with God. So don't give up on your kids because God will never give up on your kids. My wife does a, a prayer meeting on Monday nights. It's called Moms on Their Knees, and they are praying uh, for our kids. They're praying for your kids. They're praying for the moms in this church. I want to encourage you on Monday nights at 630 to come. Are you burned out? Are you bummed out? Are you broken? Are you exhausted? Look, I want to encourage you this morning. Moms rock when they look to the rock, all right? Moms rock when they look to the rock. Moms, you need to look to the rock. Everything that you need, everything is found in your husband. <laughs> Ain't no one amen in that. Get behind me, Satan. Everything you need is found in Jesus. Don't look anywhere else. Look to him. Paul was in a moment of great weakness, buffeted in his flesh with a messenger of Satan. Don't say that's your husband right now. Okay, that would not be good. And he prays three times. This is what Christ says to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Come to him as you are with open hands and ask him to fill you with everything that you need, and this is what he'll do. He will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ever ask or think. Father, thank you this morning for the moms in this place. God, strengthen them, we pray, by your power and by your might. This morning, as our eyes are closed, as we're in an attitude of prayer, maybe today the relationship that's broken in your life is your relationship with God. You know it's not right, and I don't need to go through all the details, but you know it. And this is one reason why you're sitting here this morning. You need it fixed. The most important thing in your life is broken, and you need it fixed. Your moral goodness will never fix it. Your church attendance will never fix it. You becoming a better person will never fix it. Bringing your kids so they can get a religious foundation is not going to fix it. The only one who can fix it is Jesus Christ. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. You can't get to the Father unless you go through Him. Today, that broken relationship with God can be mended by confession and repentance, confessing to God what he knows already you've sinned. We, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That broken relationship can be mended as you trust in Christ, as you believe in his death and his burial, his resurrection, saying for yourself, I believe 
Jesus, that you died for me and that you rose again for me. And as you invest your faith in that, the gospel, God does the work. He does the work. Today, do you need that broken relationship to be fixed? If you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ this morning, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. An opportunity to be believing today, to experience the promises of God in your life, to know real purpose and satisfaction, to have the assurance, the absolute assurance of everlasting life. It can be yours today if you will believe. This morning, if this is you, you would simply say, Derek, that, that is me. I want my broken relationship with God to be fixed. I need him. My life is broken, and I know it today. I know it. I need God. Today, if this is you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand this morning? Would you be bold enough this morning to acknowledge that, to stretch your hand up, to allow me to pray for you today. God bless you in the back. I see your hands. Anybody else? I see your hand in the back. I see your hand in the back as well. doesn't matter how old or how young you are right now. God has brought you here, here in the center. And I see your hand as well, both of you. And over here on my right, God bless you as well. Stretch that hand up in faith today. Let God do something great. Don't be in a place where you have not because you've asked not. God will receive you just as you are. This is his promise. You can come today. Get that hand up high. Anybody else? Awesome, I see your hand. God's tugging on your heart. Let him win this battle. Don't fight against him. Just one more moment. Get that hand up this morning. You can do this. This morning, also, if you're prodigal, you've been running. This is the truth. You've been running from God. You've had maybe a foundation that was laid by, by parents. People have been praying for you. You've been wayward, off track. Today is the day for you to come home. The eyes of God have been scanning the horizon, waiting for you to make this decision. Don't postpone it. Don't presume upon the grace of God. If you're prodigal today and you need to come home to your Heavenly Father right now, I want you to raise your hand. Get that hand up. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much for raising your hand. Anybody else? You can be honest today with your need. God, thank you so much. We bless your name for these. We pray, God, that you would give them strength now to take this step of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For all of you who have raised your hands this morning, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. It's a prayer of faith. Christ, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly. Today, I'm going to call you publicly as well to give you an opportunity to make a stand for Jesus Christ. If you raised your hand today, this is what we're going to do. I'd like you to stand up, come on forward to the front of the stage. I'm going to meet you halfway. I'm going to come off the stage, come forward here to the front. Um, don't leave me hanging this morning. I'm coming down here. You need to come as well. Awesome. God bless you. Stand right now. All who are broken, all who are weak, all sinners condemned, unclean. If it's hot and you're thirsty, He welcomes you home. Come as you are to the Lord. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow may not come. Run to the arms of the Father. His rescue is enough. Lord, we will run to you. With open arms, with sin laid down, with lifted hearts, we give up everything 
and count it all as loss when we surrender at the foot of the cross. All right, I'm going to lead you in prayer this morning. Very simple prayer. God hears this prayer. He's promised to. His word says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So as you pray this to God, he is going to answer. Let's bow our heads together. And I'm going to pray slowly today. I'd like you to follow me in this prayer. Just make this your prayer uh, out loud to God. Dear God, today I give you my life. God, I've sinned against you. I'm repenting. I believe in Jesus, that he died for me, and that he rose again. Today I give you my whole life. Cleanse me from my sin. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, one more thing real quick, okay? Uh, moms, would moms stand up? Stand up real quick. Awesome. Okay, this is what we're going to do. First of all, just moms. First of all, uh, Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10 tonight, you have to come back tonight. It's a mandate, okay? Um, second thing is this. I want you guys to stand up, lay hands on moms. We're going to pray for them real quick, okay? Lay hands on moms. God, thank you. We pray that you'd bless these moms. We're so thankful, God, you have given us su such great gifts in these beautiful women. We pray that you would refresh them, renew them, strengthen them, give them hope. God, we pray you would lift up the arms that hang down. You would strengthen feeble knees, that weakness would be turned into strength. God, that sorrow would be turned into dancing and joy. God, that confusion would be turned into vision and guidance. God, we pray in this, your church, right here, God, this, your church, that you would bless our families, that we would be centered around the person of your son, and that we would shine as a light in a very dark place. God, thank you today. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Amen.